one. We are live. Welcome everyone. Uh, exciting to see people trickle in um, to this fantastic session today with CAGS. We are gonna take a moment and uh, we'll be with you very shortly. Dennis and Jeff, change of plans. When I say hello, I'm gonna ask you just to say, you know, hi, I'm Dennis Barrow from doctoral student at Nipissing from Newfoundland and Jeff, the same thing, okay? Fantastic. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Gose. I'm going to kind of get us started here because we are at 27 attendees and people will continue to come in. So uh, with that being said, I just wanna say, Hello uh, and welcome uh, to everybody to the second CAGS virtual symposium. So my name is Danuka Gunaratna and uh, I'm actually uh, stepping in for Ian Worley who's also hosting another concurrent uh, session at the same time. Um, I'm actually uh, supporting CAGS uh, on various special projects um, and uh, but currently work full time with the University of Waterloo in strategy and communications. Um, and I just would love to uh, acknowledge that we are doing this symposium um, hosted primarily out of the city of uh, Ottawa virtually, which is built uh, on the unseated Algonquin Anishinaabe territory. And CAGS and those gathered here today, um, you know, we honor all First Nations, Inuit and Métis people and the valuable past and present contributions to this land. Um, I personally am joining you today from the traditional territories of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee people uh, in the city of Waterloo, which is situated on the Haldeman track, uh, the land that was promised to the Six Nations uh, that includes 10 kilometers on each side of the Grand River. So um, to me as an, uh, an uninvited immigrant um, to this country, it has been very meaningful uh, to acknowledge the land and, and be present in uh, uh, knowing that I have uh, all these, uh, you know, uh, opportunities because uh, of this, this land. So very grateful for that. So on behalf of the CAGS Board of Directors, um, again, we're delighted to have you join us today. We hope that this week-long series of six webinars will serve to inform, connect, and inspire you during the um, very, um, you know, unprecedented and, and ever-continuing uh, moment in history. Um, and specifically in higher education. The event, uh, events plan this week will address a variety of challenges, opportunities, and inflection points in graduate studies, including student empowerment, the use of digital tools and technologies, strategies for collecting, preserving, and sharing data, equity, inclusion, and the struggles against um, anti-Black racism in our systems. Uh, the goal of this virtual event is to provide a forum for sharing information, experiences, uh, posing questions, and building strategies for adapting to our new environment. Um, and I know if any of you joined us yesterday, there was a, a lot of dialogue and, and interesting conversations happened around, again, data and, and sharing and preserving data. So before we begin, uh, officially, I would love to uh, share some housekeeping items and announcements. So the first is that this session includes a simultaneous remote transcription service, which you can access through the link provided in the chat menu. Uh, a new window will open on your internet browser and the translated text should begin streaming automatically. Secondly, if you have any questions or comments for the speakers, please feel free to use the Q&A tool, which is um, you know, at the bottom of the screen, you'll be able to find that. If you would like to pose a question verbally, let us know and we can offer you the virtual mic, the essentially kind of moving you into the, the speaker arena. If you would like to converse with other attendees throughout the session, please use the chat uh, menu uh, at the bottom as well. We also highly recommend that you select speaker view on your Zoom screen by clicking on the top right-hand side of the window. 
uh, that will allow you to see all the speakers uh, as they speak. Finally, the webinar is recorded and will be made available on the CAGS YouTube page um, in a few weeks. So those are kind of my uh, preambles uh, space for all our wonderful attendees. And so with that, now I would love to introduce the webinar itself for today, which is titled Adapting Methodologies During the Pandemic Using Digital and Arts-Informed Research in the PhD Dissertation, a dialogue between the supervisor and supervisees. Today, this group of panelists will seek to, number one, reconceptualize traditional models of graduate uh, mentorship, including the digitalized rapport, bu uh, rapport building between supervisor and supervisee. And secondly, reimagining re the methodolo methodological role of the arts in doctoral research during a global pandemic. The webinar will be moderated by Dr. Douglas Goss, the former chair of graduate studies in education and the current director of social work as well as the Associate Dean of Education and Professional Studies at Nipissing University. He is a published novelist and uses art-based research, particularly fiction writing as a research methodology. With that, I'm excited to pass the virtual mic to Dr. Goss. Thank you, Danuka, for that, pres uh, for that presentation. I really appreciate it. Uh, yes, I'm Doug Goss. Uh, as Danuka just said, I wear a variety of hats. Uh, until recently, I was chair of grad studies in education. Currently, I am an interim director of social work and associate dean of education, social work, criminology, health and phys ed, and the list goes on. It's very busy. <clears throat> but when I began this journey as associate dean in January, I had a few graduate students, including uh, Jeffrey Thornborough, who's here, and Carrie Jantz, unfortunately, is unable to join us today, but also Dennis uh, Barrow. Uh, Jeff and Dennis, could you say a word or two, and we'll have more introductions in a few minutes, please, starting with Jeff. Hi, everyone. Um, so as Doug mentioned, my name is Jeff Thornborough. I'm a PhD candidate at Nipissing University. Um, I'm also a faculty member with the School of Social Work uh, at Nipissing. And so if you can connect those dots together, Doug and I have um, a relationship that, that is defined in several ways. Um, and you know, I'm just happy to be here and, and to share with you all um, a little piece of my journey moving um, into my research. Uh, at the time of COVID and uh, continuing to build a, a relationship with Doug. So thanks to CAGS for um, this and I'll send it over to Dennis. Thanks, Jeff. Um, uh, my name is Dennis Barrow and um, I'm a second year, I guess, PhD student. So I'm excited today to uh, meet with you all and to have a chat about my journey um, during, uh, as a PhD student, um, during the pandemic. So, uh, you know, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to share this, uh, my narrative, uh, and thank you to CAGS for, for hosting this today. Thank you both. And uh, I'm very pleased to have everyone present today. So I'm going to attempt to share my screen. Let's see. Is that clear for everybody? Thank you very much. I'd like to begin this meeting uh, by acknowledging that we are in the territory of the Robinson-Huron Treaty of 1850, and that the land on which we gather is the Nipissing First Nation traditional territory and the traditional territory of the Ashnebek. We respect and are grateful to hold this meeting on these lands with all our relatives, friends, and colleagues. So here we go. As uh, Danuka mentioned, we're talking about adapting methodologies during the pandemic, our digital and arts informed uh, strategies that we've had during this somewhat unprecedented period over the past year or two. The first thing I'd like to talk about as a supervisor is authenticity. So I want to share a little bit about my background. 
if you were able to ascertain a, a slight accent uh, between myself and Dennis, you realize we're both from Newfoundland originally. I moved here in 1999. Um, I do have a BA, an honors degree in French Caribbean literature from Laval University. So, donc, s'il y a des questions en français, ça me fait du plaisir. You're welcome to ask questions at the end in French. I did my Bachelor of Education. My background is as a teacher, <clears throat> excuse me, at Memorial University. I did my master's in education there in teaching and learning, second language instruction. And I did my PhD in social justice and cultural studies, essentially sociology at OISE at U of T. Uh, since I came to Nipissing as a tenure track faculty in 2005, I was interim chair of the IS division, the Intermediate Senior Division in Education. Uh, most recently, I was chair of grad studies in education, which I very much enjoyed. And uh, now I'm associate dean of education and professional studies. Uh, Carrie's unable to be here today, but um, for the past year or two, I've been the supervisor for both Jeff and Carrie, and Dennis uh, is newer to the PhD program, started last year, and uh, was in, of my, one, in one of my courses at the PhD Summer Institute. And uh, we clicked and have this common background in education and roots in Newfoundland. So when he approached me about being a supervisor, of course, I said, yes. So I wanna give a little background on authenticity and the PhD supervisor role as well as the supervisee relationship. Now, if you Google that, you will often find a moniker that the title of your thesis doesn't matter. The subject doesn't matter. All that matters is who your advisor is. That's a bold statement because I do feel the supervisor should have knowledge and background in either your theory or your methodology or some combination thereof. But certainly the role of a supervisor is one of unique mentorship, many highs and lows in the, in the doctoral journey. And, uh, you know, completing a, a, a PhD dissertation is one of personal growth as you develop confidence and trust in yourself. And you really ideally need to have that confidence and trust in your supervisor as well as your committee. Making deadlines really helps the process. And in regular times, this is pivotal, but during the pandemic, of course, so much is unprecedented. There are work commitments which have changed and uh, all of us who are working in education, social work here, uh, we kind of are doing double time, I would say, teaching online, adapting to committee work online, family obligations which do not go away. That whole cycle from birth to death continues everything in between. So we've had to be versatile. I've had to be versatile and supportive. Now working with a supportive supervisor who is sincerely interested in your work is paramount. And shortly we'll have Dennis and then Jeff tell more about their research. And I definitely am very intrigued and they'll also relate how they incorporated some elements of arts informed or arts based research. So it is a journey. There are ups and downs, a bit like a hill or a mountainous area. And you kind of have to ride out the lows and keep uh, with persistence moving forward. Now, here are some metaphors. Years ago, I, I uh, created a document for graduate students. Uh, a certain part of the doctoral journey or graduate journey as well at the master's level, there's hidden curriculum. Not everything is overt and clear. So when I looked at research and I discussed this with colleagues, I came up with a number of metaphors which are often used to describe the relationship between the supervisor and the supervisee. One of them is like a marriage or a courtship. It certainly is intimate and has ups and downs and you have to work through any conflicts that arise and conflict can be a good thing, a part of the learning process. I'm not so fond of this one, the parent-child metaphor, that's a little paternalistic. We're all adults, we're all mature, we're all working professionals. 
I do kind of like this one, big brother, big sister, younger sibling. I can, I can live with that one. Then you have a gardener and a tree, which is a very naturalist kind of uh, metaphor. You have the sun and the field, which uh, strikes me as somewhat lofty because I, as much as there are power dynamics, I like to believe that we have a somewhat flattened structure and, and you know, my role is one of support, but certainly a supervisor is not all knowing. <laughs> uh, another one is carpenter apprentice. My carpentry skills are very poor, but I do get the, uh, the metaphor uh, there. You have a soothsayer, truth seeker, a coach and a team player. Now, the ones that I personally relate to the most are a mentor and protege, as well as a guide traveler. And this morning, I just had a little bit of an epiphany. <clears throat> One thing when I'm talking with my uh, doctoral students and candidates, um, you know, pretty often we talk about mental health and how are you coping? Because I think pretty much everyone is under and added anxiety, added pressures at work, added pressures with schedules, deadlines, et cetera. So one, I've done a few things during the pandemic. I've, I've definitely been quite quarantined myself, uh, meeting people virtually every day, but I started baking. And I thought at this stage in my life, it's never too late, but I felt I had to develop new um, hobbies and things that were productive. And this is some fresh bread that I made. So I guess you could describe the supervisor-supervisee relationship as somewhat that of baking together. And you, you, when, when I started baking, I would have to Google the recipes and I had some recipes from Newfoundland um, and I would follow them stringently. I'd still mess up if I got distracted by a phone call or whatnot periodically. But after a while, after I made bread, for example, three or four times, I didn't even have to look at the recipe anymore. So I think it's a little like that for a supervisee. You sometimes need a fair bit of direction starting off. And then as things come together, you're able to proceed in a more autonomous way and, and check in and, and maybe discuss the new recipes that you're coming up with jointly, which, which is a wonderful thing. Now, uh, for the graduate students here, I'm not sure what stage you're at in your programs, but at least at Nipissing and many other universities, when a student enters the program at Nipissing in education, doctoral or master's degree, uh, you have an advisor appointed to you. So when I was chair, I would, uh, I would look at their letter of intent and look carefully at what they desired to research in that preliminary stage when they applied, and I'd match them up with the faculty member as best as I could who had similar strengths in research. Now, sometimes that advisor does become a supervisor, but not always. We uh, kind of follow the motto of uh, encouraging our students to do their required and elective courses, and maybe they change their mind, Sometimes they go off on a different tangent for what they want to research. Sometimes they don't, but when they're exposed to more professors, sometimes they develop a, a unique or closer relationship with, with somebody else than the appointed advisor. And that's where that relationship part comes in. If you have a supportive, caring uh, supervisor who's able to guide you, uh, you know, it may not be the one, the advisor that you're appointed with uh, first. Now, during COVID-19 over the past year or so, it's unprecedented in our lifetimes for most of us. And we've had to engage in a lot of creativity and adaptation due to the constraints on traditional fieldwork and data collection. And certainly Jeff, who's a little more advanced in this program and is a PhD candidate now, ABD, all but dissertation, he'll definitely be talking about that. Dennis is uh, going into his second year soon. Um, the way we do our doctoral program at Nipissing, we have two summer institutes that normally are on site during July, they're one month. In the first year, students do two courses. In the second year, they do one course, a reflective type course to, to prepare them for the comprehensive exams and their thesis proposal. But as of last year and this coming uh, summer, we had to go completely online. So I have never met 
Dennis face to face, but we've certainly had many, many talks and chats through virtual media. Now, some of the adaptations, I, I've listed their Blackboard Collaborate Ultra, cell phone and Teams. Um, we use Blackboard for our online courses. Most of our graduate courses at the master's and PhD level at Nipissing in Education are in fact online even prior to the pandemic. Uh, but a number of our students do live locally. Some of them teach part-time at the university. You know, normally we have more face-to-face -face interactions with people. So we've certainly used Blackboard Collaborate Ultra, which allows you to create a room similar to what we have today on Zoom, where you can see the person. And I think we've adapted to it very well. It's practically like the person I find is in the same room with you. And um, my cell phone, you see a picture of me there with my dog, Archie, who's being very quiet, knock on wood. And uh, it's pouring rain here in North Bay, so he hasn't been out much today. But, um, you know, I walk, my reward at the end of every day, four or five o'clock when I finish is to take the dog, take Archie on a nice walk, and usually a car drive. And uh, as Jeff and uh, Dennis can, can attest, um, we frequently have talks on the phone, and I, often I say, I'm out walking my dog, and I'm around the beach. We have huge, beautiful lakes in, in North Bay, Ontario. And also sometimes as Dennis and Jeff can attest, I'm driving and it switches to Bluetooth and we'll have a half hour sometimes or an hour long chat. <laughs> so it's pretty good. And Teams of course is another forum where uh, certainly Jeff, who's also my colleague, he's tenure track in social work. I'm in terms uh, director of social work. Uh, like I say, our relationship has various levels and layers to it. So we often have chats on Teams as well. Now, one thing I did, we have a brand new chair of grad studies. So up until December, we had instigated monthly or bi-monthly meetings on Blackboard for the graduate students, which I think Jeff and, and um, Dennis and others very much enjoyed. Um, we had a, a seminar on how to get a supervisor at the master's and PhD level, which was very much appreciated. Again, uncovering that hidden curriculum. We also had some seminars on how to do, um, how to craft an OGS, an Ontario Graduate Scholarship in a shirk. And um, I have three doctoral students I'm still supervising. And I have one master's student uh, and they're all well on their way. Um, so I think those were very helpful. And as a supervisor, even during the pandemic, uh, you know, I'm very upfront, even Dennis and I had a chat yesterday and we were talking about the intricacies of supervision during the pandemic and my new role as well as associate dean. And, uh, you know, I, I've shared with Jeff, I've shared with Dennis, I've shared with Carrie and Jennifer, my master's student, if, if, you know, we agree that we want to work together and my role is supervisor, I insist on at least one conference presentation per year, such as what we're having today and also one uh, published article and probably Jeff, we, we've done a few things like that. You can probably mention some of those things we've done with our book chapter, a couple of presentations. And it's such a joy because it is a mutually beneficial rapport that we build. And of course, I, I think my graduate students, my supervisees certainly learn from me, but I also learn from them uh, in, in various ways, their new ideas, their new approaches, their new methodologies, such as appreciative inquiry. Hey, Jeff, which I wasn't too familiar with because my areas are really qualitative research. I do some mixed methods and then arts and forms. So using the arts as a methodology or one of the methods uh, during the, oh, I hate to say data collection, but for want of a better term in, in qualitative research. It's a very positivist, perhaps, approach. And I would say as well, I'm almost finished. There is a certainly a distinct consciousness that there was added pressures during the pandemic. You know, it's tested everyone's resiliency. And um, I keep saying, and I'm sure Jeff and, and uh, Dennis and everyone I work with have heard me say this more than once. If ever there was a time we need to be you know, particularly kind and compassionate with one another during this pandemic, always, mind you, but particularly 
now. <clears throat> Excuse me, my allergies. Um, and you know, people, I think I do detect some COVID fatigue amongst, amidst everyone I work with. And uh, you know, it's 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 a tough period, but when we work together and support together, we we get through it together. So with the pandemic, uh, Nipissing announced quite a while ago that our, our graduate students, masters and PhD could not do face-to-face -face research collection, data collection. So we really had to pivot. And of course, with the arts-based aspect, uh, that's easy because you can use fiction writing, you can use painting, you can use collage, many different methods. But Jeff has a has a mix, and Dennis is, has come up with a mix, <clears throat> and they will talk about uh, their adaptation to methodologies. And um, you know, my philosophy as a researcher, because I've done a lot of standard qualitative research, but I've also um, represented my research often in fictional ways, including some poetry. So from my point of view and what I try to impart upon my graduate students in the various courses I teach is that voice is very important. Your voice in the dissertation and that of your participants, if you have participants. Authenticity, I want to see you in your research. I want to see your presence, hear your voice, as well as that of your participants, if you have participants. And one of the key strengths of arts-based or arts-informed research is being able to forge bridges between the academy and the broader public. When I became an academic, started my PhD 20 years ago and got my uh, tenure track position in 2005, I was adamant about creating bridges between my academic research and the broader public. So I published some educational novels or Bildungsromans, uh, that type of thing, which are accessible to uh, people who are not academics, but uh, uh, regular folks in society. So final thing. Oh, here we go. As Danuka said, today we're going to reconceptualize traditional models of graduate mentorship, including di digital report building between supervisor and supervisee and reimagine the methodological role of the arts and doctoral research during a global pandemic. Thank you for your time. And uh, we'll have questions at the end. <clears throat> Dennis and Jeff are gonna talk for several minutes, put it that way. And uh, Dennis, the show is yours. I will uh, stop sharing my screen. Okay. Thank you everyone. I'm going to uh, Okay, can you see my PowerPoint there? Uh, yes, play from start, please. Now, um, there's a bit of an issue. Can you see it there now? Um, it didn't switch, did it? Didn't switch, no. no. Okay, I'm working off two screens here, so. Take your time. It's not, you can't see my PowerPoint now, Doug? No. <laughs> no. This is right. not uncommon. It's in keeping with yeah. the presentation because often we, now we see your PowerPoint. If you can try to play it from the beginning. Yeah, it's, uh, but what, what's happening, uh, it goes to the other screen. Oh. When I, when I select from beginning. Um, okay, let me just see if I can just cheat a little bit here. Now I can bring up your PowerPoint if you like. Okay, would you do that? I think I can manage that, okay. no problem. Okay. Just one sec, Dennis, and you just tell me when you want me to okay, uh, well, change slides. Okay. I'll stop sharing. 
All right, share screen. One moment. Yeah, one thing we've all learned is patience with technology. <laughs> <laughs> Just one sec, here we go. Now I have it, share screen. There we go, Hello. and I'm going to play it from the beginning. There you go. You see that clearly? Yes, I do. Thank just, you, Doug. Just give me a, 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 a hey, bye, or now <laughs> when you right. want, to, when you want to change. I will, I will. Um, uh, thank you, Doug, for that wonderful introduction. Um, and like I said earlier, um, uh, my name is Dennis Barrow, and uh, today um, I just want to have a chat with you about arts-based research uh, during the pandemic. So I guess, Doug, we can go to the first screen. So I guess uh, to give you a little background about who, who I am and, and um, where my journey started, um, I am a Newfoundlander. Um, born and bred, and I've been here um, living in, in Gander, which is not my hometown, for the last 10 years. Um, I work in the Newfoundland Labrador um, English school system. Um, I'm on my 25th year, and I'm currently, uh, for the last 10 years, um, I'm a K-6 to program specialist, so I work with K-6 to teachers. Uh, I am now going into my second year in the PhD program at Nipissing, and I'm also a part of the LGBTQ uh, plus community. Uh, my research interests, I guess, will be looking at um, experiences of LGBTQ plus individuals in Newfoundland and Labrador, specifically uh, looking at uh, the stories and narratives of um, LGBTQ plus leaders in the Newfoundland and Labrador English school system. And so I will be exploring those um, and writing about those through fictional writing. Okay, so next, Doug, please. We'll go back one. There we go. Uh, so as I uh, work through um, this, I, I call it a, a conversation. So um, I wanted to tie in some of the, uh, uh, some of my culture, um, so my Newfoundland culture, since my research is going to be based in this province. Uh, so I wanted you to, to sort of get a snapshot through pictures and words of some of my, my culture and where I'm coming from, which has helped shape me as an individual. And, uh, you know, so, through some of the language, uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, some of the language, uh, Newfoundland language, and I'm going to make some connections with uh, some of the things that are that is Newfoundland based. So I guess you know um, uh, the picture there on the screen is a picture of a Newfoundland rug, and I guess when I looked at it first, uh, I made some connections there with. Um, my journey as a PhD student. So first of all, who knit ya is a Newfoundland expression that we use many times uh, when we're trying to find out someone's family relations or who their, uh, their mother was or their relatives. So that's sort of an expression. So I figured it tied in neatly with what I'm trying to do here. So there on the screen is a Newfoundland rug. It is basically made up of um, different pieces of, of uh, fishing line or fishing rope uh, from fishing boats that have probably washed up on the beaches in Newfoundland. And so what they do is they take each rope uh, and they join it together. They have, each rope has got their own unique story. And I look at this and I compare this to uh, my experience as part of a PhD cohort. Uh, and that includes as well professors. So we all come together with our different narratives, our different uh, stories, our different origins. And basically, uh, with through that, we're joined together. 
and we're strengthened. It becomes more stronger. And that strength then we help to create a new narrative. So much the same as the, the fishing rope, you know, it was used for another purpose. Now it's joined with other pieces to, to form uh, and be repurposed and to, to um, I guess, to, to make it more stronger. And each mat is unique. So each cohort, each experience is unique. And, you know, we all come together, uh, you know, we're all weaved in together. All of our stories, our experiences are all intermixed together. So I guess I just wanted to talk to that, you know, as I want to tell you more accurately and authentically, uh, the start of my journey, uh, my PhD's journey with the wonderful people that I've, you know, that were walking each other home along the way. So, okay, Doug, next slide. Okay, so I guess we look at, um, so what are you at is another Newfoundland expression that we use uh, basically, what are you doing? It's a, it's a greeting. And so graduate mentorship during the pandemic. Um, I have to be honest with you, uh, last, uh, when I was notified that I, I got into the program, it was in March of last year. And actually, I was attending a conference in a city about four hours away. And but when I came back home, uh, we went into lockdown. So it's sort of like um, the pandemic stole my thunder. So, like, you know, I couldn't uh, celebrate because we were trying to just cope with this pandemic. And so with with the uh, with the pandemic, like, uh, well, before, when I applied for the PhD program, I had some preconceived notions of how this will play out. And, you know, so some of my pre-pandemic expectations was uh, to, well, the summer institutes will be on campus. I've heard so much about Nipissing and the beautiful scenery and just being able to experience that in such a very, um, you know, uh, natural way and to interact with others you know so I was looking forward to that I had my mind made up and really you know this is going to be a great experience you know that selection of supervisor you know so that would have occurred you know through you know being able to have those interactions with um, you know potential supervisors in a face-to-face -face setting or even like I've heard about some of the socials that they hosted for PhD students and, you know, just being in a very relaxed atmosphere and being able to authentically get to know someone. So I was sort of looking forward to that. And then the in informal hallway chats. So, you know, just, just reaching out to others, you know, while you're on your way to class or, you know, through interactions between uh, classes or, you know, just so those informal pieces. So I was looking forward to that as well. And once again, I alluded to earlier was the social. So I'm hearing about, you know, the barbecues that they had and just getting to meet other students and other faculty, you know, it would have been a great experience. And of course you get, you make those uh, connections with others that you probably would miss uh, in other situations. Uh, also to like, you know, the negotiation of research theories, looking through and understanding more and getting more deep understanding of uh, research theories, coming through those natural conversations that would occur in the classroom. Uh, so of course, you know, that being in the same physical space would have uh, led to much, I, I think, uh, uh, more of a deeper understanding, but also the professional networking. So you would get to meet other individuals, other professionals, and being able to network in that space was what I was expecting as well. And of course, you know, connections made through the regular office hour. So, you know, being able to reach out to certain faculty, being able to, you know, go in and have a, a good conversation with them. So, of course, that was my pre-pandemic expectation. So, of course, all of this was going through, and I was thinking, okay, I'm going to get up to Nipissing. 
uh, you know, North Bay, I'm going to explore that. I'm going, you know, and all these things. And then the pandemic hit. And then it, I realized that we were going online. So these were the pandemic realities. So the Summer Institute uh, was via Blackboard Collaborate. So once again, uh, it was a platform that I wasn't familiar with. So uh, that first morning, it was just like really, um, you know, it was it was certainly a time, a lot of new things happening. And I can remember reaching out to Doug uh, at the end of the first week, <laughs> just thinking, uh, you know, I don't know if I can do this. This is like, there was a lot of new things on the go there. And I think that probably it was a normal uh, reaction uh, but I think at the same time, if I was in the same physical space, it may have lessened a bit because you would have been able to share stories with others as well. Um, and the selection of supervisor uh, via virtual interaction. So, uh, and I'll speak to this in the next slide, but right now, like, um, I mean, Doug and I, I guess I had to rely on that uh, means of, of that virtual platforms to reach out to others and to try to uh, make a decision of, you know, uh, what do I want in a supervisor? Would this person be a, a good choice as a supervisor? You know, personality wise, are we, you know, do we gel, do we mesh? Are we, you know, on the same page? So all of these things I had to negotiate uh, through uh, virtual digital means. Uh, so, of course, our mentorship as well, um, you know, with Doug, like Doug had mentioned in his intro, um, you know, many times that we've talked on the phone, through text, email, virtual platforms. And I think, too, with Doug, uh, where he was chair, um, that was my contact when I was applying to Nipissing, and I had some questions that I wanted answers. For, and Doug, I have to say, was the one that, you know, because I was looking at a, a different, I guess, journey, you know, pursuing another graduate degree, a master's degree. But Doug said, well, have you thought about a PhD? So, you know, we really, um, I guess, connected uh, and, you know, and that helped drive that further deepening of the uh, relationship. Um, and the socials through Zoom. So, you know, throughout, um, you know, the, uh, the fall as well, like making those connections with others, especially in my cohort, uh, and also the information sessions that the university put off and what Doug facilitated as well. So once again, that was another um, a difference in what I expected and what the pandemic brought. Also to the development of theoretical knowledge through online courses. So, uh, you know, with the summer and the two courses, you know, all of that piece happened during online. And, you know, and I have to, I'm going to be honest with you, like, uh, you know, with this being a new experience for me, trying to negotiate and, and learn new material, and it, it was, you know, it was challenging. Uh, but uh, once again, there was a lot of support there from the professors, uh, from my cohort. So we all uh, gelled together. We all, you know, that that strength um, came through. Uh, you know, that relationship building occurred, even though it was on through online means. Uh, uh, professional networking through webinars as well throughout the summer. Uh, during that institute in July month, uh, we had uh, special webinars. You know, presenters talking about the research. Uh, other pro uh, professors, you know, talking about their experiences. Uh, so those uh, services and those information sessions were still made available, even though, uh, you know, how they were made available changed. We still got the same thing, even if we were, you know, there was no difference whether you were online or even if we were on campus, we still had that same level of, um, of services. Uh, and of course, with the, the uh, pandemic realities, the connections that we made uh, with supervisors and others, well, basically that transcended time and space. So, you know, like Doug said, he, we chatted many times when he might have been uh, out for a walk, you know, took the dog out or out for a drive, or I could have been talking to him from, 
you know, on the highway or going through a, a fast food restaurant, <laughs> right? So we've done that. And uh, so it, it uh, you know, we've made it work. We made it work. And so that was, that was uh, you know, it, it was, and basically it wasn't, we were isolated um, because the whole world was adapting and trying to uh, roll with the times during the pandemic. So the next slide, Doug, please. So, you know, when we talk about rapport building uh, during the pandemic, uh, basically, um, you know, and I, Doug and I, I guess, you know, since that initial conversation that we had in the fall when I was deciding whether to apply to Nipissing, uh, we had an instantaneous, I guess, connection. And I think too, um, it's because of Doug's personal nature. He's very personable. Uh, we, we share as well a similar sense of humor. And I think that probably goes back to our common cultural background. You know, we're both from uh, Newfoundland. Uh, so it's, we almost got, when we see Newfoundlanders and other parts of the world on our travels, we always, it's almost like, uh, an extended family. We're all related some way or somehow, but we all have that connection. And I think with Doug, I felt that. Uh, we're part also of the same sexual minority group. Uh, and also two similar experiences in, I mean, Doug spent some time in the Newfoundland Labrador school system as well. Uh, and we attended the same uh, university, Memorial University. So we had a lot of connections and uh, there as well. And of course, ultimately, it, we had the similar research interests. So, you know, Doug's area of research is similar to what I want to learn about. And I find, you know, with the, um, uh, I guess, the connections that we made along the way in terms of our, our cultural background, it sort of, uh, I guess, solidified the relationship further. So that, these factors I look at that made the virtual rapport building a lot easier. So, okay, the next slide, Doug, please. So, um, so basically, uh, the, you know, when I look at the uh, data collection or reimagining the, the research during the global pandemic, uh, well, there's no need to be, uh, to be traipsing around. So that's another expression. Uh, to be traipsing around means that we don't need to be uh, uh, going around unnecessarily. So basically now with the pandemic, uh, I had to uh, reimagine how I'm going to collect that data. And I just want to throw it out there. Um, you know, I have another summer institute coming up in July. And so during that month, I'm hoping to uh, shape up and solidify uh, where I'm going to go in my research, you know, shape up the question uh, and also the data collection. But right now, um, when I'm looking at what I'm thinking, the direction I'm going to go in, I've had to really go back and, and think about how I'm going to do that. So, you know, first of all, starting off with the ethics application um, right now, it's going to have to be adjusted for digitized. And I guess when you're dealing with multiple platforms and the virtual platforms, the concern lies with the privacy part of it. So uh, trying and, you know, being a an employee of the school district, I'm quite aware of, you know, privacy and how that works. And so that's another layer there that I need to really uh, dig in. Also to the criteria to select participants uh, include a geographic location in Newfoundland Labrador. And what I mean there is, uh, you know, pre-pandemic, um, you know, uh, because we have a lot of isolated areas in Newfoundland, Labrador. Um, so I would have want to met with the participants in a face-to-face -face setting. Uh, but um, in order to do that, I would have to ensure that participants are from, a, you know, the, uh, I guess, a geographical area that's not too far apart. So, you know, I would have to basically uh, narrow that geographic area. Uh, and of course, when I think about the island of Newfoundland, I can certainly, you know, I could, I could take in the whole island. But uh, like I mentioned, um, with Newfoundland and Labrador, now that it's opened up to, uh, to do a virtually, 
I'm open now to have participants from all parts of the of Newfoundland and Labrador. So I could have someone from Maine right to St. John's because it's a virtual means. So that's one of the things I guess it opens up that that uh, that door as well. Um, I would have liked to have had two in-person semi-structured interviews with participants. And you know that face-to-face -face would have helped build that rapport with the participants to make them feel at ease. Because the topics that you know I wanted to research uh, is sensitive uh, and it's something that I feel more comfortable talking to someone face-to-face -face about. Um, so when I talk about you know two semi-structured interviews, when I think about the virtual, moving to that virtual platform, I'm gonna to have to start off at the beginning with just an introductory uh, session, um, you know, and to help that build that rapport. And given the virtual platform that I will be using, uh, I'm gonna to have to probably stretch out the interviews uh, because I don't, when you're in a face-to-face, -face, I think conversations become more natural and it's more of in a safer space and there's really no like uh, immediate barriers. But, and so people are, you know, the interviews could probably be longer, but in a virtual means, um, oftentimes, you know, I like to try to keep things, um, you know, not, not to, to run it out too long. So I would have to chop up those sessions and have multiple sessions at shorter length than I would than if it was a face-to-face -face as well. Also the focus group, um, I would have loved to have them all come together in the same physical space, um, you know, and, and to share stories and, and, you know, and I think that that would have worked really well, uh, but now I need to reimagine that and put it, uh, I guess, look at online focus group. And once again, with the, a focus group like that, um, I'm always fearful that, um, you know, all voices are not heard equally. And so once again, that goes back to norms. And, and I guess, you know, that's something I'm gonna have to negotiate uh, as I get in there and try to, to think things through as I'm reimagining my research. Um, and also too, I wanna use uh, photo elicitation uh, to anchor that, you know, the face-to-face -face conversations. And now I need to look at that, I guess, in a way of a virtual means and the sharing of digital photos, uh, how will that look? You know, uh, will they use their own, their own camera, their phones to, 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 to capture that? Um, you know, what if I want to step out and use artifacts? So I need to look at that as well um, and try to adjust that for the virtual platforms. Okay, Doug, I guess we'll go to the next slide. So um, I guess I wanna talk to about the, the virtual influence leading to selection of arts-based research methods. And I guess um, I've, I've talked about how I'm going to reimagine my research, uh, you know, going from a face-to-face to a, a virtual. And when I look at that, I often wonder, um, you know, how it will work out or whether, you know, there's gonna be some gaps there. But uh, I guess one thing that came out of the, um, you know, the virtual piece and how we started off, and I guess, you know, when I look at it, our cohort are digital natives in the sense that we are, uh, we started out digitally and we're continuing. So, you know, and like Doug said, we did not, uh, we've never met physically. And I said, when we, uh, when it was decided they were going online the summer, um, you know, I, I, there was almost that urgency that, you know, I have to meet this group before we graduate, we have to meet together. And hopefully the pandemic will, things will become more normal at that time. But with the arts-based research methods, um, I guess the virtual, the online um, interactions sort of led me to, to move in that direction because through uh, discussion posts and uh, you know, sharing of written work online with others, uh, you know, based on some of the feedback that I got, I'm wondering, you know, 
I have a natural uh, tendency uh, or I guess a an attraction to fictional writing. Um, so I started to think more closely uh, about uh, fictional writing uh, to, to, I guess, to communicate my results to a wider community. So of course, through the feedback that I got from others, I'm beginning to, you know, you, maybe I need to explore that further. So, you know, right now I'm gonna go, uh, you know, and explore that more in depth this summer, but I'm leaning more towards, uh, you know, using fictional writing uh, and to tell the narratives uh, through fictional writing of others, their experiences, my experiences as a leader in the Newfoundland Labrador English school system. Uh, so it was through the virtual means that I started to think, you know what, maybe arts-based research is my way, you know, and I'm thinking that maybe I need to, to explore that further and to um, open up my mind and my options. And I guess that came through the online interactions with others and the feedback that I received from other writings that I've done. So I think and that that was one of the things that really one of the benefits of uh, virtual interactions. And of course, the yes by um, that's, a, I guess, a Newfoundland term as well. Uh, that's when you give an affirmative response or yes by, you know, that's a great thing to explore that art space research. So, uh, you know, and of course, with, with Doug's work as well uh, with art space. Um, you know, I'm I'm really excited about that prospect, and I'm looking forward to diving more deeper into that uh, at the Summer Institute this summer. Okay, the next next slide. There we go. And of course, all these pictures uh, have been captured from my journeys through my work. I visited a lot of isolated areas, uh, so this is a. Uh, a wonderful picture of an isolated uh, place on the south coast of Newfoundland, uh, only accessed by ferry. So, like I said, uh, fictional writing, but it's like yarning, you know, we're telling stories. Um, and, uh, you know, basically, I just want to weave the experiences, my experience, and other leaders, the experience of other educational leaders, LGBTQ leaders, uh, and show that in an authentic way. And, you know, I feel I want this to reach a wider audience. And so this is why I wanna, you know, ex you know do it through fictional writing. And um, so, you know, as I work through this and do more research about it, uh, I'm starting to get more and more excited about that prospect. So, um, you know, thank you for uh, listening to me today. Uh, as I share my experience and you know my pre-pandemic expectations and the pandemic realities. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Thank you so much, Dennis. I certainly hear the authenticity and sincerity in your voice. And uh, next we have Jeff Thornborough, uh, who will share his uh, thoughts and, and creative research with you. Please go ahead, Jeff. Okay. Everyone see that okay? Yes, we do. Great. Yep. Play from start. Okay. So, uh, once more, thank you everyone for uh, attending this here with us and thanks uh, to CAGS for putting this on. Um, so I'll, I'll try to be uh, concise and brief um, so that we still have time for uh, some questions at the end. Um, I'll start by just uh, going over very quickly around my own journey. Um, so I am a social worker by trade. I've been a registered social worker um, since 2011, have been working in um, the helping profession since uh, 2000. So I've been part of, of uh, that uh, broader social work field for um, over 20 years now. And um, uh, the most recent um, uh, position that I held was a community-based psychotherapist. And so um, what that is, is essentially offering psychotherapy uh, to children and families um, 
uh, but uh, within the community. So um, instead of families coming to the office, um, I would go out to them. So go to their homes. And in many instances, I would go to schools and partner with schools um, to um, help with uh, children's mental health issues uh, as they presented in the school setting. So as I was um, uh, in this role, uh, a common theme at least, and I'm sure that, that uh, other people in, in um, a similar role might have saw things differently, but for me, the common theme um, that I saw within the homes and schools was the theme of attachment and, and how um, uh, children were uh, attached to their primary caregiver and what sort of attachment um, concerns were manifesting in uh, either behavioral issues or um, or mental health issues in the school system. And um, so this was sort of my uh, my foundation and my my drive for entering into uh, PhD um, research uh, to explore this a little bit further and particularly in the school system. Now, of course, I am a social worker, so I, um, uh, I want to continue just as my colleagues have done with uh, Doug and Dennis, uh, placing myself within uh, my research. Uh, it is essential for all qualitative research and particularly uh, arts-based or arts-influenced um, uh, research. And so um, I am a social worker. And, and so uh, although my focus is, is primarily on attachment work um, and attachment within uh, a kindergarten classroom, um, uh, it needs to be noted that, of course, broader social systems are also at play here, and, and so how those attachments are formed and, and uh, created and, and uh, the environments that offer the opportunity for attachments to be created um, differ uh, greatly depending on, uh, well, on, on a number of different um, uh, considerations. So, um, you know, there I was, I was thinking uh, that attachment in, uh, in a kindergarten classroom with, with um, uh, children uh, entering into the formal uh, education sector was uh, a great topic to explore um, and engaging uh, very um, uh, on, a, on a surface level uh, within the literature. Um, it was, um, it, it sparked something in me to see that, that uh, a lot of the literature did not have um, an opportunity for the children to have their voices heard. Um, in the research. And so um, you'll see here that my questions for my, uh, my doctoral research are, are really uh, in line with exploring how, um, uh, I guess, the, the child's perspective on uh, formulating secondary attachments or um, um, additional attachment with uh, teachers. So uh, more specifically, I'm looking at appreciative inquiry. And so for those of you who are unfamiliar, um, it is a, a, an action-based uh, research methodology. Um, the primary difference with AI research as compared to other uh, art um, action-based uh, methodologies is that the, it is um, uh, connected to looking at positive elements. So uncovering, um, and promoting and exploring and highlighting the positives that are already um, being offered in institutions and organizations um, and being able to build on those pieces. Um, but like uh, other uh, action-based methodologies, um, uh, AI does look to have um, to, to partner uh, with, co with participants uh, being seen as, as co-researchers. And so that's, um, that was my primary focus. Now, um, in, a, in a different webinar, I might um, discuss even further around uh, my exploration and finally ending um, up uh, infusing arts-informed research with my AI. Um, however, um, for this webinar, I'll just note, yes, I'm infusing arts-informed research with my AI methodology. Um, and, you know, ultimately um, uh, using arts um, offers the opportunity to really 
uh, build a, a, at least from my perspective, a much fuller story. Um, so being able to, to break through the barrier of, of um, solely focused on linguistics or, or, or um, uh, an exchange of words and recognizing that um, my particular demographic that I'm looking at for kindergarten students, um, there are many different um, modes of communication um, that have not been explored greatly in the in the literature, and so that's that's where I'm I'm uh, gearing my research towards. Particularly, uh, I'm looking at comics based research, um, and uh, you know, <laughs> it's funny that Doug and I have had these conversations where. You know, initially, I had no idea that that comics could even be uh, part of research, and um, you know, it was it was an off the cuff uh, conversation that him and I had one day that that just opened my eyes to um, having comics uh, being part of um, my research. And since that day, I've just taken that that idea and ran with it uh, as fast and as hard as I've could uh, for the past uh, two years. Um, and ultimately, you know, the, the literature also uh, supports um, the, the use of, of comics uh, within uh, research. Um, Cohen specifically notes that um, children as young as three years old can, um, can and do um, articulate sequential art. So that is uh, multiple pictures that, that form to create a story. Um, in fact, even uh, at times much more so they're able to, to do that um, as compared to a, a simple conversation story. So I had um, this uh, drawn up plan, my comps were completed. Um, so my comprehensive exams to enter into ABD. So um, to transition to candidacy. Uh, I was ready to, to write my research proposal. Uh, had a great nine week plan to, to get in there and do this AI research. Um, everything was looking great. Well, then COVID-19 hits and even the best laid plans, uh, they often go awry. And so um, uh, this was in, in March, of course, of of 2020 and and um, it you know when when you have this this uh, idea this vision this this story that you've created in your mind to uh, to run with with your uh, doctoral research um, to be shifted um, and to use uh, a now uh, very infamous word with COVID-19 uh, to pivot uh, so greatly. Um, or at least staring down the prospect of pivoting so greatly in the research that you've uh, uh, wanted to do, it was uh, a really difficult uh, piece uh, for me to wrap my head around. So, um, you know, reforming uh, the relationships that I had, not just with, with Doug, um, who, as he noted, was um, a colleague of mine as well, and actually had his office was two doors down from mine. So being able to walk down the hall and just uh, talk with him around uh, new ideas and um, new thoughts around my research. Um, it really did create a huge shift. And, you know, I wanted to, to put my head in the sand. And in fact, I did for quite some time. Um, and so it wasn't until, um, you know, Doug and I had continuous conversations, uh, virtual conversations, where we started to uh, be able to, to piece together my research um, uh, plan and my vision uh, and instead infuse um, some virtual elements into this uh, plan in order to make sure that, that it didn't deviate too far away from where my heart was resting. I still wanted so badly to, to look at, at attachment work with kindergarten students. I still so badly want to infuse that comics um, uh, connection with the arts informed piece. And um, so, you know, I, I sat um, and, and I, I looked, uh, you know, essentially with Doug, we, um, you know, I think this Lee um, reference is, is a good one to note because it, it fr from an institutional perspective, you know, the message being given from my, my institution at Nipissing was that we can't do face-to-face -face, uh, research. And it's quite disheartening when you're looking at attachment work and you really want to get in there and, and be with um, 
with the students and with the participants. Uh, so, you know, reformulating that that connection that I had with my university to recognize that that um, yes, uh, this is an uh, an international pandemic, and so we can't permit you to go into schools, um, uh, but that they will support me um, in any way I, I could find um, in terms of a path to, to uh, continue my research. And so that's what I did uh, with Doug's support. Um, you know, him and I, we, we scoured through some literature um, and, you know, I bounced some ideas off of him. And ultimately um, it was, it was really um, trying to find a way to, um, to shift my own thinking uh, in, in the research and, and so recognizing that although um, I had a vision of this research and, and what I was gonna do with it, um, it can still happen and occur, um, but it just needs to look a little bit different. And you know, so um, uh, being able to, to look at attachment, um, but through video conferencing, being able to um, build uh, comics with students, uh, but using mobile apps and recognizing that, in fact, there are new opportunities here um, that we didn't really consider uh, before COVID. And this goes just as much with connecting with Doug as it does um, entering into this research. Um, that, uh, yes, I wasn't able to walk two doors down, uh, but I could pick up my phone anywhere I was and I could, I could uh, call him on Teams and he'd pick up. And so, you know, it, it would just be about um, turning my ideas uh, and moving um, towards and, and leaning into um, these new opportunities as opposed to balking at them. And, and you know, it was, it, was a, it was a shift and it was, it was tough for me to do initially, um, but I think we're at a good place now uh, where um, my, research, my research proposal is, uh, is due in two and a half days. And I will uh, endeavor as best as I can to get that into Doug. But um, you know, it uh, through this whole process, um, you know, everything ebbs and flows, and and uh, my excitement dipped. Uh, but I think um, through the added exploration um, uh, of where I can take this research, coupled with um, the added support that Doug was was able to offer me, um, that. Uh, excitement is is reignited. It's engaged, and and uh, I'm I I feel like this research is going to be really meaningful, not just to um, myself and the academy, but as all inf uh, arts informed research is looking towards. I want to break through that um, uh, that element and and bring it towards a, a broader audience. And um, so, thank you. Um, and I think we still have some time for, for questions, right, Doug? Yes, we do. Thank you so much, Jeff. That's, uh, I always say every time you mention the, the comic portion of your dissertation using comics, you're, you light up every single time. So that's, that's a good thing. Uh, we do welcome any questions, French or English. Um, I can translate. Um, so please don't be shy, anything that crosses your mind. You can also raise your arm if you wish to speak. You're visible there on the right-hand side under, and in chat. Uh, Doug, while, while we wait for our wonderful audience to, um, you know, kind of come up with some questions, which we encourage you to use the chat or, or raise your hand and we'll, uh, we'll allow you space to speak. But I have a question that I'm very excited to ask from Jeff, uh, if that's okay. Um, so Jeff, you talked a lot about comics and, and Doug just like mentioned that you light up. Um, so tell me a little bit more in, you know, in terms of you coming up with, is, is that also connecting with the personal interest of yours into your research coming in? Um, I'm curious because I'm all about, you know, students who light up when they talk about research. Uh, I worked with graduate students for five years at U of A, so always very curious if you can comment. Sure, yeah, and thank you for the question. Um, uh, so is it a personal interest of mine? Well, yes, uh, I grew up reading um, superhero comics. 
um, my, my older brother was a big influence on me and he, and he, uh, he got me hooked on, on comic books. And, um, uh, so I think, um, I think I would answer the question in two ways. One, yes, there was a personal interest of, of mine that um, I've always been uh, keen on comics and not just superhero comics. Uh, in fact, my grandmother had a, a whole bunch of, of old um, comic books uh, that uh, were about, you know, Frankenstein and, and all this stuff. So it was a lot of fun. But the second, the second piece to, uh, that I'd like to answer um, with that question is uh, through the, the literature. When, when you read about the power of, of what comics can, um, can have uh, in um, academic research, uh, it's, it's very exciting to me. I think it, it, it's, um, it's underutilized and, uh, and I'm really excited to be able to, um, uh, to, to, kind of, to use my research as, as uh, one more bridge towards um, uh, connecting comics to, uh, to academia and uh, connecting research to the broader uh, audience. So, yeah. Fantastic. Uh, and did it change then like, you know, kind of the methodology, like since that we've kind of come into the pandemic and do you think post-pandemic you will you will continue to like even if we can meet people let's say in person next year sometime hopefully fingers crossed uh you know would the methodology change or now that you've changed it like you know you kind of have to continue doing that to wrap things up in the current way sorry is that directed specifically to me for comments yeah, uh, yeah okay. that was a follow-up just really quickly to you jeff yeah yeah um so uh Comics um, has been uh, part of my proposal even pre-pandemic, and so um, it was. Um, I, I don't see it uh, shifting away from from comics-based research, uh, comics-informed uh, research um, uh, post-pandemic. Uh, but yes, uh, methods might look a little bit different if I'm permitted to to do more face-to-face -face work. Uh, but ultimately, I think some of the of um, the uh, new uh, opportunities, such as um, using uh, applications and, and technology to build these comics with these students, uh, I don't see that that shifting back to pen and paper or markers and paper, which is what my initial plan was going to be. I really think that uh, we'll, we'll continue to use technology, yeah. Yeah, thank you. And that's kind of where I was thinking you know, are these changes we're seeing in, in technology use in research, is it going to stick around or go back or maybe it's now more options and more ways to think about how to conduct research. But with that, Doug, I, I see there's two questions, one in the Q&A, uh, I think, as well as on the chat. Okay, great. Um, is it Gagan Gill or um, I think you're asking, are you able to speak or? Yes, let me just... Uh, I will allow you to talk, Gagin. Can you speak uh, and kind of share your thoughts with us? Yeah, thank you uh, again, everyone, for uh, presenting. And it's super interesting that you folks are adding some art space stuff. Um, so I'm, I'm in my uh, my master's program, and I'm thinking of adding a couple of vignettes into my thesis, just to tell a story of indigenous work and what sort of things. Um, you know, they recommend, right? So they can um, talk uh, to a broader audience. So I guess my question is, I know one of the panelists was talking about fictional writing. Um, could you talk about that aspect of fictional writing and, and if the scene has been laid down, how will we go about doing that? Um, just wanted to know more information about that. Thank you. I can start, Gagan. And, and when you say vignettes, what do you mean? It's similar to fictional writing. Um, okay. So it's going to be um, like I'm going to be doing um, participant participatory research, uh, but I'm going to be kind of doing like a fictional fictional slash vignettes uh, about some of the themes and some of the findings that I found uh, in my research. And Gagan, what's the title of your research or what is it about briefly, please? So I'll be looking at um, how do um, elders, well, basically how do elders and um, social work faculty think um, Canadian education can be 
um, change to uplift uh, Indigenous youth in their care. Um, Wonderful. So, Wonderful. Yeah. I'll just start off briefly and then probably Dennis and Jeff can can pipe in. I mean, vignettes and, and stories and anecdotes are very common in qualitative research anyhow, including in Indigenous research. And Don Two Arrows, oh, I think that's the full name. He's published quite a bit on, on storytelling in Indigenous uh, methodologies, and there's other folks as well. I don't know if you're familiar with his work, um, but certainly that's been done many, many times um, and, and is certainly a part of, just like Newfoundland culture, what we call yarning or storytelling, it's certainly a big part of many Indigenous cultures as well. So I think working with your supervisor and doing a little bit of a literature review to find some researchers like Don Two Arrows, um, you know, should be readily doable for you. And um, maybe, uh, maybe Dennis, uh, do you have some insights there as well, please? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, thank you for adding that, uh, for asking that. But um, yeah, um, I guess for me, fictional writing, I'm still trying to navigate those waters. Um, but I, I, you know, the vignettes is probably one option for me. Um, but I'm, I'm thinking more along the lines of a novel. So just taking the information, the stories, the narratives of, of my participants and myself, and probably flowing that into a, uh, a novel type of writing. Uh, but, um, you know, it is a good question. And I guess the summer, uh, you know, hopefully I'll be able to dig in and do some more research on that. But it will be a fictional writing, but how that will look, uh, I need to take some more time and to do some more research myself. Thank you for a great question. Yeah, Gig, and before Jeff pipes in, I'll just add Tara Goldstein at Oise at U of T has used theater um, as participatory, participatory action research. So you can certainly Google some of her work. There's a multiple ways of including fictionalized accounts. And I'm not sure what your theoretical perspective is. I'm more of a post-structuralist, uh, but a pragmatist, which is a bit of a paradox. So if you are a post-modernist or post-structuralist, the line between fiction and reality is quite blurry anyhow. And some theorists would say that everything is fictional. So it's, uh, you know, if you decide to delve into a, a bit of a literature review there, you'll you'll find that quite enticing. And Jeffrey, would you like to add a little bit there, please? Yeah, well, I mean, I um, I can speak to um, infusing comics into um, research, uh, and you know, there there is a lot of literature out there that that I, I think that there are comparables um, that. Um, using comics. And so uh, one of my uh, dissemination intents is to uh, build a comic uh, book out of um, the research that I'm engaged in. Um, and so that would um, look uh, very similar to, to fictional um, writing or creation, um, but it's based on and, and rooted in the, the data that's collected through my uh, appreciative inquiry um, uh, methodology and so um, like like Doug mentioned there's lots of literature out there that that um, will uh, make that connection for you um, much easier to um, uh, to find thank you Jeff I'll, I'll make a final comment in my humble perspective I think when you're doing a dissertation or a thesis at the master's level or major research, topic, one of the most important things is to do something that you're really passionate about, you know, and, and that'll carry you through those ebbs and flows. Uh, Gagan, would you like to make another comment? Yeah, totally. Like I, I, this, this is some of the, like some of the stuff that I didn't really know that you can actually put in a, in a thesis <laughs> work, right. And then doctoral, um, uh, you know, dissertation. So it's super good that, uh, that I'm hearing all, all this and how, there's, there can be comics in, incorporated into it and fictional writing, so it's it's very very rich for me. And um, I'm still at the beginning stages uh, of my of my work, so 
Uh, I'm just trying to gather as much information. And as, as you guys mentioned, it's, uh, it's very rich as when you're telling stories, um, particularly the ones that you're, you're with people who are vulnerable um, and stuff like that, right? So um, that's awesome work. And I look forward to seeing how um, some of your guys' work plays out in, in the coming months, right? So uh, please keep me in the loop. And yeah, thank you guys. Thank you, Gig. And, and keep in mind, it's your supervisor and your committee that will determine what's acceptable for your thesis or dissertation. So as long as they support you, and you know, we, we want many of us at least to encourage creativity and we have to keep expanding the boundaries of what research can be. It wasn't long ago, just a couple of generations ago that everything was mostly quantitative. And now we have qualitative and we have a whole spectrum of qualitative as well. And last year, as Jeff is well aware, there was a master's student in Nova Scotia, I believe, and someone in B, uh, BC, they did their full thesis as a graphic novel. So there's many, many different types of thesis. But again, it's your supervisor and the committee and the external examiner, if you have one who would determine uh, if it's academic rigorous and certainly creativity is what we're all about or should be about in my view uh, in academe so thank you uh, anybody else have a question or comment uh, Danuka I think we have about three four minutes uh, yes yes Doug I think we have about uh, three minutes um, before we will wrap uh, up for our audience so if anybody has a, a quick co quick comment or a question uh, put your hand up and I will let you in Danuka, are, are we able to share our PowerPoint um, PowerPoints with the the attendees? Just because I because of time, I I, I quickly shut off my my screen share and, and wasn't able to offer the references in my PowerPoint. So, um, is there a way Absolutely. to get to people? Because I think uh, for yeah. for and for others, it'd be worthwhile to see those those references. I Absolutely. Uh, what I'll, I'll what I'll share, Jeff, is that yeah, share them with us, uh, and uh, I think Ian will kind of look at how we distribute them. So that will be great. I do notice there is uh, uh, I think Lara has her hand up, so I'm really quickly going to let her in. Perfect. And by the way, I think our bios have our emails, so if anyone is interested, just emailed any of us, and we'll share what we have. Please go ahead, Lara. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I hope you can hear me. So you yes. can hear me? Okay, great. So I just, um, the previous person that asked the question, I just um, examined a really fascinating PhD from a colleague in South Africa, um, their student, and they used vignette um, research. Uh, so if, if he wants to contact me, I can put him in touch with them because the student had really, really good resources and also the methodology of the study was really sound. So if he needs some information, I can put him in touch with them. That is great. Thank you so much, Lara. This is what makes me very excited to be in grad school, the, the clashing of uh, knowledge, expertise, and the networks. Uh, Lara, if you want to just uh, private message uh, Gagan, you can do that using the chat or just drop your email to the chat. Um, so that is fantastic. Um, but with this, I guess, uh, Doug, I'll, I'll wrap it up for all of, uh, for all of us today. So I just want to say a big thank you to Dr. Douglas Goss, um, Jeffrey Thornbro and, and Dennis Borrow for, uh, joining us today to have this really interesting conversation. I'm, a, I'm, you know, a, a student of, uh, you know, doing biology and, and science, and, and this is so exciting to, to hear, um, all the amazing research that you can do in in um, in the art space inquiry and research. Uh, right now, as a communications professional, my whole world revolved around storytelling and vignettes and and how do we connect people. Um, so it's great to see all that coming together in research. So. Thank you so much uh, for your time. Um, to the audience, we are really excited to share that we have a few more uh, sessions taking place um, you know, this week with, uh, with our symposium. So uh, make sure to check us out. Uh, tomorrow's webinar will be on building paths of self-discovery and development, empowering graduate students through a digital platform. So I guess our speakers are going to be talking about, again, more uh, conversations around digital technology tools and engagement. So 
that uh, being said, again, thank you, everybody. And I really uh, wish all of you have a wonderful afternoon. And Doug, amazing work. Uh, you know, I will make sure that your contact information and everything's shared so that people can connect. So with that, have a fantastic afternoon. Bye-bye now. Bye.